Hello and welcome to the public television of Armenia. A war in Artsakh started on September 27 in 2020 by Azerbaijan, Turkey and affiliated terrorists. That was largely covered by foreign media and freelance correspondents and journalists and media agencies. Over 800 journalists flew to Artsakh to cover the events at the place. Many of them, seven of them, injured and they were covering the attacks by Azerbaijan, Turkey and the terrorists. And today I am honored to host Chuck Halton, who is a freelance journalist from USA and has worked in Artsakh during the 44-day war. Chuck, thank you very much for your time. It's my pleasure. So tell me, please, why did you decide to come to Artsakh to cover the war? Well, I'm a freelance war correspondent, and so that's my job. Uh, this was a conflict that I wasn't really familiar with, and uh, one of my viewers contacted me and said that they should that I should take note of the conflict that was happening in Artsakh. Uh, I'm also a member of the Free Burma Rangers, which is a humanitarian aid organization made up of former special forces and special operations uh, soldiers in the United States. And we go to war zones around the world and, and bring help and hope and love to the people that are affected. So the Free Burma Rangers were interested in coming as well. And so, those two things together focused my attention on Artsakh, and uh, I started to learn about it. And when I when I realized that this had a real uh, connection to the Christianity of uh, of Armenia, one of my big clients is the Christian Broadcasting Network in in Virginia Beach, Virginia. So I ran it past them. They thought it was a great uh, idea for me to go cover it, and so I came to make television. Uh, for a couple of weeks during the, the conflict. Mm -hmm. When did you arrive in Karabakh and how long did you stay there? I arrived the last week of October and uh, stayed into the first week of November. Uh, and so I got kind of the middle of the conflict. I didn't get the very beginning, but there was already enough uh, coverage out there to make it clear that it was worth covering and that this was not just a a regional conflict, but it had much larger implications uh, globally even. And so uh, I, I came and was able to go through the process of getting my permits and, and press passes and that sort of thing to go in and cover the, cover the war. And so we were able to go in and, and stay in, uh, in Artsakh for several days. And uh, what, in what places have you been and uh, what did you see in general uh, during the war? We were at the, we were in, in downtown Stepanakert when the hospital was bombed. Uh, and actually I was just happened to have my camera running when, when the bombs went off at the hospital. And so we, we ran down and, and documented the damage that was done by the missiles that hit the hospital. Um, we, we went around Stepanakert and uh, when the bombs would fall, we would go find where they had landed and, and interview the people who were affected. Um, several old women, Tatiks, who uh, miraculously survived, uh, although their homes did not, uh, to, to see um, the civilians that were Im impacted by that. We interviewed uh, quite a few civilians who were taking shelter in uh, cellars around Stepanakert. Uh, did, was not able to make it to Shushib, and so uh, that was the extent of my, my coverage at that point. Um, you've been covering many war zones, and uh, as I understood from what you mentioned, you are a former military. So right. what was the hardest part for you in Artsakh? It, it's difficult to see, uh, it's always difficult to see how civilians are impacted by wars that I cover. And it's always the civilians who suffer the most. Uh, and so uh, to go and, and listen to these women uh, standing in front of their homes that were completely destroyed uh, is not only uh, emotionally difficult to, to process, but uh, it's even, even more difficult. It, it's, it's infuriating when you see that this is being done intentionally. It's one thing when you cover a conflict and a bomb goes astray or something goes wrong and civilians are, are, are affected. But in this war, civilian, the, the, the war was being waged against the civilians in order to drive them out of the area 
so that the Azeris and the Turks uh, and the terrorists, as you described them, uh, without having to deal with the civilians who lived in the area that they were trying to take over. They did that very effectively, but it's a very cowardly way to wage war. Uh, and, and I guess I've been doing this for almost 20 years. And so uh, I've seen so much mayhem and, and death and destruction that I'm maybe a little bit jaded to it. Uh, but you can't help but, but kind of feel the emotion of, of anger and sadness uh, when you see civilians being targeted in that way. Okay. Azerbaijan denies it committed war crimes against the civilians, as you mentioned. And uh, international media also survived, as I uh, mentioned before, by Azerbaijan, Turkey and terrorists. And as a journalist who witnessed many atrocities and documented them especially, well, what would be your kind of a message to uh, the people who are sitting in Baku offices? Well, I would say to uh, President Aliyev uh, that either your men are uh, extremely incompetent and are unable to target military uh, targets and, and take them out effectively, and so you accidentally routinely bombed civilian targets on a on an almost daily basis throughout that conflict. Uh, it, it wasn't a matter of, you know, an oops that, ha I mean, collateral damage happens in war. And you, you see that happen with the American military. It, it, it just recently happened in Afghanistan. And when it happens, when collateral damage happens, the the right thing to do, the the honorable thing to do is to go on television and say, I'm the president, I'm the, 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 the last uh, commander, the, I'm, the, I'm the commander in chief of the military, therefore I'm responsible for uh, any civilians that are accidentally killed. And I am uh, deeply sorry for that. And it should uh, be known that the, whatever commanders were responsible for that lapse in, in training, poor, poor judgment, whatever, have been relieved, that sort of thing. That's what, that's what honorable nations do when civilians are affected directly by military strikes. That's not what we saw from Azerbaijan. Um, and so just to simply say that didn't happen, well, I was there on the ground. I interviewed the people. I have the footage that, uh, of, of civilian homes that were bombed, of uh, you know, the cluster munitions that were used on civilian areas, of the hospital that was literally taken out, the whole wing of the hospital, by a missile. So either Azerbaijan and Turkey were engaging in a cowardly, uh, dishonorable tactics in war, uh, war crimes, without a doubt, or they were so incompetent that they couldn't hit anything of value militarily and were just bombing civilian tar, just throwing bombs wherever they could. Either one of those is, is, uh, is, tells us something about Azerbaijan and Turkey. And I'll say this, a year earlier, I was in Syria uh, with the Free Burma Rangers and the same Turkish drones that were bombing uh, um, the uh, Artsakh that were bombing uh, Armenian mm -hmm. soldiers on a daily basis and civilians dropped a bomb on one of our ambulances that was clearly marked, that was far away from any military targets. So it's clear that they don't have any qualms about bombing things that are typically off limits, uh, civilians and medical personnel and things like that. So uh, I, I, it doesn't surprise me and it leads me to believe that it was intentional. Especially with the precise targeting uh, equipment, military equipment, right? You you can uh, bring in. You cannot bring any justification. Oops, yeah, they, I didn't right. want, but it's. Uh, so it leads me to ask uh, Aliyev, or uh, Ali Aliyev, I'm sorry, or, uh, or or President Erdogan, explain to me what threat this Armenian Tatik was, this 85 year old woman, hmm. whose house you leveled in Stepanakert. What, what kind of threat was that to Azerbaijan? What kind of threat was that to Turkey? Well, it's not a threat, but they were, they, their, their actions showed that their military was too cowardly to simply fight the Armenians toe to toe. And instead, they just tried to demoralize them and make them leave so that they could just walk into Shushi, for example, and take it over. Mm -hmm. So what do you think about the so-called uh, trophy park in Baku? 
Uh, to, it's one of the most dishonorable things that I've ever seen. And why do you uh, think so? Well, because the, okay, so, so Azerbaijan gained territory in this conflict. Uh, they, they hurt Armenia very badly. They, they, they murdered thousands of, of Armenian sons. When you make gains like that in a conflict, the honorable thing to do is to be magnanimous and to say, okay, let's, let's try to find a way to, to get along now and, and have peace. But they're not doing that. They're doing what they can to hurt Armenian mothers and fathers, to hurt Armenian daughters and sons whose fathers didn't come home. And so uh, I, I think it's, it's disgusting. And the, the national, international media should have made a much bigger deal out of the fact that they were putting on display, you know, dead soldiers, prisoners, uh, you know, things like that. Uh, to say nothing of the uh, international conventions of war, which obviously uh, Azerbaijan does not ascribe to. Uh, so you, you can't really try to hold them to the Geneva Convention. They don't ascribe to the Geneva Convention. They don't care. Mm. Uh, they wouldn't have, have, have bombed civilian targets in Stabonikert if they cared. They don't care. Uh, and so trying to, to, you know, tell them that they're committing war crimes they, they could care less. It's apparent to that. And, and I'll, I'll say this, the comments that I get when I make statements like that from hundreds of Aziris who get on my social media show me that the, the, the Azeris have been conditioned by their government to hate Armenian people. And until something like that, and until they love their children more than they hate Armenians, to paraphrase gold in my ear for uh, about the Jews, um, nothing will ever change. And, and that's uh, the real unfortunate thing is that I think there's gonna have to be some reconciliation, there's gonna have to be some forgiveness at some point. Mm. Uh, we know that uh, we need to raise the international and global awareness about uh, war crimes and conflict in uh, Nagorno-Karabakh and Artsakh. I would like to know what uh, do you think you could do uh, for the awareness raising in U.S. and uh, about the issues going on in, in this region? Uh, well, I've been trying to do that by continuing to report on on the on my own podcast, uh, the Hot Zone on YouTube, and uh, and on CBN and elsewhere. Uh, but I, I think it needs to go beyond just uh, raising awareness about the the damages that have been suffered by Armenia. I think uh, the thing that I learned when I came to Armenia, I, before this conflict happened, I knew, where, I knew there was a country called Armenia, but that's about all I knew about it. I knew it was a former Soviet satellite country, but that's it. When I got here and I met the Armenian people and I fell in love with the Armenian culture and food and the, the beautiful history that you have here, um, I realize that Armenia is so much more than just a tiny country in Asia. And, and when I also learned that the Armenian people are my brothers and sisters in Christ, and that I should be supporting them, that, that for all the Americans who talk about that we have to stand up for Israel because the, the, the Jews are God's chosen people. Well, if you're going to stand up for the Jews, then you should much more stand up for the Armenians because the Armenians are fellow Christians. And they're surrounded by people who want to murder them and they want to wipe them off the face of the earth. And they're a much smaller country with much less support. So they need the support of the United States. They need the support of the American people. And I believe they have it once the American people understand that they're more than just a former Soviet satellite country. So when I learned that, I realized that I wanted Americans to learn that. I wanted Americans to know that Armenia is a, fast, it's a fascinating place. It's a beautiful place. They have natural beauty here that rivals anywhere on earth. And so I've now made three more trips back to Armenia since the war, and I've brought my family and I've brought groups of friends and other people who wanted to come and see Armenia. And we're trying to, to raise awareness that way. I'm also working on a documentary about, uh, it started out just about the, the conflict, but then I realized, number one, other, others are making documentaries about the conflict. But I wanna make a broader documentary just about the Armenian people and about their history and about the beauty and everything to raise awareness for the country going forward, for tourism, 
Uh, and, and there's a, a great happy ending to that story because uh, on one of those trips, I brought my, my 21-year-old son, Nathan, along with me. And he fell in love with Armenia and decided to stay here after I went home. And in so doing, he met an Armenian girl and is now engaged to oh, that Armenian girl. Interesting. Very nice. Uh, very nice to hear. And <clears throat> as an American, um, we just learned about the congressional bill passed uh, last night on the, cutting the military support to Azerbaijan and also calling uh, to consider the Grey Wolves and other uh, extremist organizations as terrorist organizations. Mm -hmm. So uh, what do you think about it? Is it a way that America started to rethink the uh, pr progress and uh, businesses it was doing with Azerbaijan and Turkey? Or? You know, there's a saying that I've heard uh, quoted from many of our, uh, our allies uh, around the world, and that is that America will always do the right thing once it's expended all other options. And un unfortunately, that's far too true. Uh, one of the things that I think is hard for people who aren't Americans to understand about our country is that there are really two countries living in America, and they're very, very divided. And they have absolutely opposite views on almost everything. And so for four years or eight years, we have one view that's, uh, that's rising. And then for four years or eight years, we have the other view that's rising. And so that leads to a very disjointed foreign policy. Um, I have to say that uh, supporting Armenia should be something that both sides could come together on and support because it, it's, it makes sense uh, for America to support Armenia. Armenians are friends to America. Uh, there are millions of Armenians in America. And, and so it, it's sort of a no-brainer. Unfortunately, I, I think most Americans realize that we can't expect our government to be very far-sighted in its foreign policy simply because of that political division that just tears everything apart. Mm. Thank you very much, Jack, for your interview and your time. Thanks for having me. This is public television of Armenia and I hosted Chuck Halton, who is a freelance journalist from USA and has worked in Artsakh during the 44-day war. Thank you for watching us.